Welcome to Jewish Culture in Sweden Online. I am Camilla Lundberg, I am a music critic and an art journalist, and I will be conducting a conversation with composer Olga Neuwirth. Hi Olga Neuwirth, Camilla here. Hello Camilla, hello, good to see you. So I'm sitting in Stockholm, uh, but where are you? I'm sitting in a tiny little village in the south of Austria. Yeah, so that, that's where you live? No, no, no. I'm just at my mom's place during the lockdown. I was not allowed to go back to Berlin. Aha, so Berlin is where you live. Yeah. So how has Corona been for you? Have, have you been very creative? No, not at all. <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, as composers, we are used to quarantine, but we choose our quarantine. And now I'm forced to quarantine. And all of a sudden, I need some what I can contradiction with my being so I can work and compose. And now I feel like only, I don't know, no energy. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, you're a person also who cooperates with lots of artists. So I, I yeah. realized, yeah, that's a problem. So it's, it's so fun to, to, to be able to talk to you because I met you briefly in London at the um, BBC Prom. I remember. All right. And this marvelous piece where uh, you did your very particular take on Bach's fourth Brandenburg concerto. I yeah. loved it. I loved it. Yeah. I wish that, that people who, who introduced culture now could hear it because it's a great piece. But uh, I was uh, one of the uh, privileged people who, who were able to join uh, the Die Stadt ohne Juden when it was performed in Stockholm, which was oh. a great occasion. Yeah. Great occasion. And uh, you know the camera ensemble with uh, Christian Carlson as a conductor. They, I, I'm sure you would have loved it because they did it so well, and it worked so well with the film. And I, I really, really like the way you did this film music because it could have been so easy to, um, well, exaggerate it. And can you can you tell us a little about how you did it? Well, actually, it was actually one of the hardest things I ever did. So I can imagine. Yeah. Actually, first I have declined it because I thought it's not possible. Um, but um, the man who, who, who wanted me to do the music, he unfortunately died and couldn't even hear the, the, the premiere. But he was the head of the Viennale Festival in Vienna. Uh, and he said, it's only you have to do it and you have to do it. And I said, I can't. I have to write my opera. And it's so complicated. Uh, you, can, you can do the wrong thing just with one note, I, um, I think. So um, when I then finally uh, so gave in, because he was so obnoxious, <laughs> um, uh, of course, it was, I knew it is so important for me, and it's also important for my history, and it's important to give a statement, because you know, it's only from the past and the present. There is, it's actually nothing has for me, it has kind of changed these shameful conditions in a way, and what is in our, in our soul of so many human beings. So the, the thing is like, what can I do to not uh, fall into Mickey Mousing, like um, Hans Eisler calls it. That's uh, what I really appreciated, that you didn't do. Yes, because sometimes I, I wanted to do it because it's like uh, playing with the jovial language of national socialist language uh, of idioms, how they did it. And they, they still use it like in Austria here, where I live, for example. Um, it's, it's, it's still deeply rooted in the Austrian soul. That's why I use some quotes. So that there is kind of some Mickey Mousing, but only also to over exaggerate uh, gestures like in silent movies. Uh, and on on other hand, uh, I try to have a, a, to be aloof, so involved and aloof at the same time, open and heartful and living with figures. And on the other hand, like being distant with an ironic distance, let let's say. So that was a, so it's a it's a vib vibrant, vivid. Um, heartfelt um, comment on my, let's say, onmacht, my helplessness to the still uh, current parallels of hate campaigns. What happened to Stadt ohne Juden after Stockholm? Has it been performed uh, uh, afterwards? Uh, well, it has been, been performed uh, before uh, many times, but it should have been performed now in, in, in Basel, 
and in, uh, in, uh, in, even in Graz here, close to where I live, where I grew up, which was a, one of the first cities which were falling into Hitler's uh, hate yeah. system. Uh, so that would have been very interesting, the reaction of, of, of people. But it was all cancelled because of Corona. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it's, it's such an important uh, thing, this, um, uh, I mean, the whole story about the film, I mean, how it was uh, conceived as a, as a parody, as a caricature of uh, anti-Semitism. Look how stupid the anti-Semites uh, are, etc. And then the prophetic aspect of it. Uh, mm. And also, of course, modern history, how it was found again, this beautiful copy that it could be, because it's been considered lost, hasn't it? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. very interesting, yeah. because it was immediately, actually was a big success. I made a lot of research, because I've seen already the, the, the film in the, uncut, in the cut version in the 19, late 1980s. So I knew the film before. Uh, but it was, yeah, because I did a, a lot of um, uh, my identity research in the late 1980s. Uh, and so when I also I came about the book and then the, the movie. But the interesting thing is that the, the film was actually a success. But and, uh, at this time, you were allowed to make your own versions. Um, so like there was a certain version in Russia and there was a version for France and there was a version for Italy. So there was a lot of material cut out. So that was the interesting thing is then they found the material on a, a Parisian flea market. Um, so it was possible to redo it in a way, in a meticulous way, try to redo it. Tell me, you said, you said something about your identity search in the 80s. Could you elaborate a little about that? That, that was when you started as a student, your career as a composer or maybe a painter or maybe a filmmaker. I know that you were into lots of artistic aspects, but tell, tell us about it. Yes, um, um, it was for me always very important to have a political stance uh, and, and be politically engaged somehow. And I always felt there is something in um, our family history I would like to know more, so nobody was talking. So I did my own, uh, like, um, yes, identity search. I tried to look around so where all my kind of ancestors were out, where they are they coming from. There are so many languages, Hungarian, Croatian, uh, Serbian, yeah. Slovenian, and I said, what's going on? And, and so uh, when I came to, to study in Vienna, because I'm from this little village where I'm just sitting here, um, uh, and um, the interesting thing is, actually, also this is then very important for me to do this. Why I did the move, uh, the music to this movie, is because um, I went to a private, um, uh, what is it, a private uh, um, visit to the National History Museum in Vienna, and the the, the the shocking thing for me was that I stumbled on um, uh, the suppressed history of. Um, uh, um, um, uh, what is um, what it, um, killed uh, Jewish citizens, which were uh, 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 in a um, collection uh, from for anthropological research, as they called it in the NS times. Um, and yeah. I was so shocked. And, and, and I said, well, so this collection, so they, it was completely set into it was dark and, and not musty and everything. So I, I, I went to Elfriede Jelinek and told her about my uh, discovery. And she used all my information and what this kind of collection actually was and made her own research and has, uh, has used it in one of her chapters in a book, Die Kinder der Toten, in 1995. And this actually was the start of uh, making the, 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 the ball running. So it was first publicly made public what this collection is. Uh, and then uh, they started um, the process of, um, uh, what is it called, um, um, uh, what, um, to, bury, to bury the remains of these Viennese, Austrian, Jewish um, uh, uh, citizens. So it actually was a, a, a big scandal. Uh, and so for this, it, it, at, at this time, it was more and more important to find out about my own history. And at this time, then I came also about this book. So this is all connected for me in a way. Uh, and restitution yeah. was started also, restitution for the first time in Austria, make it public because everything in Austria was, you know, as we know, it was always under the surface. <laughs> we were always the first victims of, of Hitler. And, and, and it was only discussed, you know, with the Waldheim uh, affair in the, and then, you know, with this collection I have discovered. But you said that your family didn't say anything, so uh, you had to you had to start it all over by yourself. That yes, was nothing to get from your parents. No. Mm. Why? 
I think the a shame or trying to. Uh, I think the biggest is that that that, that, is that, that you become uh, the, nicht auffallen. What is the English word? Um, to be part of the society, to you know, not fall out as an outsider, to not be different. Uh, you very know, because so, so yeah, they were very assimilated. Yeah, they tried to, to be assimilated. Yes, yes, right. They tried to assimilate, and it was always it was only very interesting when my grandmother now died that I found all these birth certificates from my grandfather, for example, uh, in a little tiny uh, uh, a Jewish community in Serbia where he was born and registered. So it was very interesting. And eventually, this this also brought you to Elfriede Jelinek, or did you co collaborate with her before, or before? But maybe we felt this kind of connection. You know, sometimes you don't have to talk, and I know there are some links. Yeah. <laughs> the soul has some uh, similarities, let's say. Yeah. So maybe that was the basics. Did you ever uh, do, uh, did you ever meet Thomas Bernard? Uh, I once met her him. Yes, that's very true. Uh, only shortly before he died, and I went to this famous uh, premiere of his Heldenplatz, uh, mm -hmm. you know, the big scandal, you know, and, and I, I got a, uh, sneaked in as a, as a student on the high, what is, Stehplätze, on the standing places, and I watched the, the, the incredible outrage of Austrian politicians and people on him on the topic uh, of uh, Heldenplatz, which was also the the suppressed story again of Austria as being the first victim of uh, Hitler, which was not true, of course, at all. Uh, and he was, you know, like it was, was very sad. It was one of the moments I will never forget, you know, that all they were throwing tomatoes on him and he was already very, very sick. Oh. So one tomato really? hit him on his head and he was like always so slow because he didn't, couldn't, and he was like only like taking this tomato out of his face and then he left. And then it was actually the last time he was ever seen in public. So it was an incredible moment for me. But this again, this rage, Austrian rage. I don't like that at all. If people like, you know, the rage kills every racial rational mind anymore, because the hate campaign was so strong, also with Heldenblatt, or sometimes against Elfriede Jelinek, which is really frightening. I know that uh, the two of you, Elfriede Jelinek and yourself, uh, you have also succeeded in making hmm, some sort of scandal or, or uproar um, because uh, Jelinek says that she doesn't want to, to uh, have anything to do with music after that. Is, yes. it, is that true? Yes, unfortunately true. I lost my librettist because this was this case again. It was this libretto we wrote on, on, on an Austrian, again a case, who was a, um, a doctor uh, in, the, in the NS times. And he immediately after, which was so much, it was, which was so usual in Austria, they just went into a party, either the Christian Democratics or even the Socialist parties, and sneaked in and they like, they never had to, conf um, to be, uh, confront could be confronted with their past in the, in the NS system. So this doctor we have used became a very fa famous doctor, uh, uh, and a children's uh, do doctor especially. Uh, and so, well, this was the topic of the libretto, and of course, everybody has declined it. And it was a big scandal. And then uh, finally, like two weeks before she got the Nobel Prize, or even two months before she got the Nobel Prize, was the last one who said, no, we are not going to use this libretto or do this opera. But we were always, in, um, first we were invited, and then they read the libretto, and then they were shocked. <laughs> well, you've written a grand opera now, anyway, with, with um, on Virginia Woolf's Orlando. So yes. Tell us about it. Yeah. I, unfortunately, I couldn't make it to Vienna. I would have loved to see it. And well, it's it. not, I think it's not going to happen again because, again, it's like amazing because I went up to nowadays because I didn't want to stop in 1928 because Orlando is going to move on forever, I, I, was, I would say. It's, um, Orlando is um, a kind of a, um, what is it? Um, an, um, yes inhaling everything or um, like a swamp, what is going on around him or her. Uh, and so, so that's why uh, Orlando will live on forever. So I, I, I didn't stop in 1928, but went on until nowadays, uh, not knowing that Corona will be there very soon. And so it, I, it's like, uh, the last thing is like, what is the future? And then there's a big bang on a um, boxing, punching ball. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. um, also to show that, um, future is going in a wrong direction in a way. But the interesting thing is that, that the head of the house, the new, the new head of the house immediately said, I have to rewrite it. 
So it's amazing, like, why does a woman immediately have to rewrite her own opera after it has been a success and five times uh, sold out? So again, I think like in Austria, women artists and women, especially who speak up and dare having their own opinion, are still likely to be, uh, what is it, um, played down or annihilated, trivialized, or like even, yeah, they should shut up. So it was amazing for me that it, again it happened. Even the topic of Orlando is about uh, freedom of speech, also in a way. <laughs> yes, yes. So, uh, so what what is the future, the nearest future for yourself right now? Well, everything is cancelled. My whole year is everything. All concerts are cancelled. I had a beautiful premiere with New York Philharmonics and Walt Disney Hall, a big, you know, uh, my piece Encantadas with the acoustics of the Viennese church. And um, yes, um, Berlin Philharmonics and also Stockholm, my portrait in Stockholm. Uh, everything is cancelled. Uh, you started as a trumpet student, didn't you? You started playing the trumpet. Mm -hmm. yes. And uh, something happened to you that made you stop. Yeah, I I, I wanted to play become a, a female Miles Davis, <laughs> let's say, uh, because I wanted to. My father is a chess musician, and I was into chess music, uh, but I didn't want to play the saxophone. The, 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 that's the instrument he wanted to give me, but I wanted to be more powerful, yeah. uh, and mm -hmm. so I wanted to play the trumpet, and I played the trumpet. But then I had um, a very serious uh, uh, car accident. And oh, yeah. I had a, broke my toe bone, and then it was over. Yeah, so um, I, I had to, uh, well, what is it? Um, we had to find some um, other way to express music. Uh, and then, so I ended up kind of composed. But it's a more lonely thing than being a trumpet player. I wanted to be together with people. Uh, so there was a big difference, but it was my compensation of losing my instrument. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but you're, you're, you're actually back to trumpet when you have written a trumpet concerto uh, for, yes. yeah, okay. for okay. Yes, yes. Yeah. Because it was my big hero, so I said one day I got the possibility that now it's time for writing a trumpet concerto for Hocken Hamburg. Mm -hmm. Because when I yeah. played the trumpet, he was already, always there and I was like, oh my God, I love his sound so much. It's so beautiful and it's so strong and he has these, all these different colors, you know, the trumpet was um, at yeah. the moment, it was only one-sided, uh, in a way. Mm. Uh, of course, Miles Davis, in his way, was a very rich production, but a different way of music. Uh, so I wanted to bring all these backgrounds uh, together, mm. which I like. And so this this piece is for Hawkon on five movements, so it can be different personalities, all these yeah. five movements. Beautiful, beautiful. And um, you've co collaborated also with lots of filmmakers, not only dead filmmakers like Breslauer, but um, uh, yeah, uh, you you wrote your first thesis when you when you were into music history on uh, uh, film music by Henze. Yes, for Alain René. Yeah, um, uh, and. Um, I think it was so. I think it's so interesting that nowadays uh, um, film directors don't use this kind of music anymore. Let's say I call it this kind of music, <laughs> contemporary yeah. classic music. But at that time, let's say it was amazing that like people like Alain René knew the music of Hans Werner Henze very well, or even mm -hmm. also Godard was interested in different kind of music. Uh, um, so um, because I knew Henze very well. Um, he gave me all the material uh, in his, from his private uh, archives uh, and um, I was analyzing the film from once every second, uh, like also with the, actually with uh, the City Without Shoes, I did, you know, really analyzing frame by frame to know what is going on. Uh, uh, and then I, um, I wrote my thesis how Hensi used the, the music in the film because also it was an idea by, by René to use Hans's music only in the interludes when it was falling snow. Oh, now he was, no. in, in, uh, he was um, intersecting the, the film very rich, rigidly all of a sudden uh, with snow, falling snow. That even in the French um, uh, in the, um, television, he said, please don't switch off the television because they thought at the beginning it was, you know, um, um, interferences of the television screen. I said, no, no, don't forget it, it's just, it's falling snow, it belongs to the movie. <laughs> and this was when Henty used this beautiful, strange, orchestrated, orchestrated music. Um, that was 
my thesis. How come that this uh, people uh, don't use that kind of music anymore? Or uh, I mean, have you been commissioned to do many film scores? Uh, well, I did uh, one for the Austrian filmmaker who horribly died on um, uh, only like in 19, uh, 2014 on malaria. But, um, Michael Jawocka, who was a very well-known Austrian um, uh, documentary filmmaker. And he had asked me to do a music for his uh, one, one of his films, and he wanted me to do the music for his last movie. And, and on the way of the, to do this movie, he, he unfortunately horribly died of malaria nowadays. Uh, and, this, and the other one was that for a horror movie for um, other two young, younger Austrian filmmakers, which became mm -hmm. a big hit, actually. Um, yes, but since then I have not written. Yeah. Because maybe, maybe the music fits better to horror movies or something. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, after all, there, there are so many good composers who have written for films. I mean, uh, especially in the former Soviet Union, like Shostakovich oh, yeah. or Schnitke or Go by Dulina. Uh, really. True. Yes, so but it's interesting in a Russian talk, more in a, in a Russian, uh, at, uh, what let's say, um, more advanced, um, let's say, non commercial movies, they trusted their composers, which are um, their follow, let's say, artists, which they knew, yeah. which I think is very interesting. It's not the case, much the case like in Germany or in Austria. So the, the case with Hensi and Erlen René actually for me is a very rare connection. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you studied in the uh, United States, uh, you studied in San Francisco, I believe, or was it in Los Angeles? No. Did you ever study in Hollywood? I mean, did you ever go to Hollywood and to see, to see uh, how I it worked? <laughs> no, 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 no. No, I mean, I, I, uh, I didn't want to be a Hollywood composer, actually, because too no, many no, restrictions. <laughs> No, but I, I, was in, I was in LA, actually was, was once invited, very funny, a friend of Hans Werner Hensey, a singer, an, an, an American singer, who he knew very well, um, in, because her husband was a sponsor for a movie sponsor. So once I was really invited as a small, very small girl, 18, after a concert of her, I was invited to a, a party by the, uh, by the um, academy, uh, what is it, the, the academy um, members. Oh, yeah. Members, oh, yeah. yes. <laughs> I will never forget it. And oh my God, where am I? It's, it was surreal, actually. <laughs> yeah. So, what, what do you say uh, today? If you sort of round, sort of um, making a little uh, end to this now, what do you say to about to young composers younger than yourself today? Uh, I mean, how do, how do you see uh, the sort of twenty twenties? Could, is it possible even to know now after Corona? Well, actually, actually, I, I can't actually make any statements about it because I have no idea. Because, you know, I think our music world is really in, in question because um, it's about live music. It's not everything like virtual and what we are doing now. I think it's, it's one possibility to still hear something, but it's not the same thing. Uh, it's about body, it's about the physicality of sound. Uh, it's about human beings playing together and listening to it together and reacting to it, each other. Um, um, this, uh, to do these Zoom concerts and everything, I have been taking part on some of them. It's uh, an Übergang, it's a transition, uh, let's mm -hmm. say, possibility. But what is going to be afterwards, I think only like smaller, smaller uh, pieces, smaller or, um, or, or uh, organics, like smaller ensembles. Uh, will be yeah. not orchestras really because with orchestras they are very expensive and I think I don't quite know if there is enough money to give commissions to orchestra pieces again for uh, which is sad but I think this is the reality of economics at the moment I hope it's getting better again uh, mm -hmm. so I think we have to start from from small again and try to build up again but not and never give up yeah yeah so I mean uh, uh, if you think of sort of a a, a kind of a contemporary Mahler, Gustav Mahler, with the huge ensembles, um, doesn't have a future really. At the moment, I'm yes. In a way, what I think it's a shame because they, 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 you know the masses of sound even create an incredible vibration, 
in the room. And if you're an audience, you really feel it. It's a physical event. Yeah. Uh, and the uh, acoustic, not just electronic, but yes, also yes, acoustic. Yes, right. And live acoustic uh, phen phenomena, the vibration of you know sound is it's it's being based on uh, of, of on on on, on um, sine wa on waves on the waveforms and the waves convey to the audience. I would say, so we miss that. Uh, but I hope that this kind of tradition is not going to be lost completely. But on the other hand, I think like these orchestras when they come back, they always try to play only the tradition, and they will forget the present. Uh, so we have to fight yeah. for that. Yes, we have Find other formats. I think the important thing is that everything can live together. And it's the same like in, in society, we shall not play out each other. It's not, this is also popular reason now in the arts. It's like the, the better arts and the less good arts. And the ones you, we are more commercial are the better ones and the less com uh, commercial ones are the worse ones. So we have to try to find a way to live together also in the music world and to support each other. Yeah. Uh, when, when, uh, if some decades ago when there was this big difference between what you in German call E-Musik and uh, 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 serious music or uh, entertaining music. But you don't do that anymore, do you? Is it, well, is I, I was always trying to break the borders. That was I did already since the 1980s because I grew up like that. For me, there was no boundaries. I was always trying to overstep the boundaries because it was a normal thing for me. I didn't have to do it now on purpose or something like that. So, um, but I was in question completely in the, in the late 1980s and even 1990s because you were, were considered to be unserious. Uh, yeah. so, and really they thought it was, I am I making, I was not able to do it. I was not knowing what I'm doing. So I think, I hope that then the boundaries are now really blurring, but, yeah. uh, but I still, I still want to refer that I'm really composing every note. I mean, this is a lot of work. Uh, so I think if we are, what I'm doing is a more an old fashioned um, craftsmanship. And maybe the time is not there anymore to sit there for hours and hours and days and weeks and sometimes even years like in an opera. Um, uh, so I still want to believe in the written music, uh, but I don't want to have these boundaries between ernste Musik and U Musik. No, doesn't fit anymore. <laughs> yeah. So, Olga, I think we should uh, sort of say yeah, thank you so much for this conversation, and we are so much looking forward to you coming because you will come here. You I have so. to stop. Yeah, for and also I have a relation. You know, I have a relation actually to Sweden because my mother lived close to the uh, concert house when she was because you know Austrians were, were when they were very poor in the 1950s. They went to Sweden to work. So oh. I have to, so my mother is always, oh, my Stockholm, I re remember so well my time in Stockholm. And the other thing, I'm, I'm kind of related to um, uh, uh, the, the former chancellor, Austrian Chancellor Kreisky. Yeah, this is a, uh, and he was, you know, he had to uh, escape to, to Sweden. And Sweden was the, the country who, who made him the possibility to survive. So we have this, I have this kind of connection to Sweden, which is in my heart somehow. Yeah, thank you so much. So see you. See you and thank you very much. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you for watching Jewish Culture in Sweden online. I am Camilla Lundberg and uh, I hope you take care and will stay with us.